Welcome to Music History Monday for August 21st, 2023. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is Where is the Sin in Synthesizer? Robert Moog and Synthetic Sound. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. We mark the death on August 21st, 2005, 18 years ago today, of the American engineer and electronic music pioneer Robert Moog. Born in New York City on May 23rd, 1934, he died of a brain tumor in Asheville, North Carolina, at the age of 71. First things first, let us pronounce this fine man's surname properly. It is not pronounced as Moog. Moog is a sound made by a cow after she painfully stubs her hoof. Despite its double O, the name is pronounced Moog, as in Vogue. Moog didn't invent the sound synthesizer. Rather, he and his inventing partners, the composer Herbert Arnold Herb Deutsch, 1932 to 2022, and to a lesser extent, Wendy Carlos, born 1939, democratized the thing, making it affordable, portable, and playable enough to be bought and used by anyone who could get around a piano-like keyboard. Our Game Plan Today's Music History Monday and tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes posts are conceived as a single post, one that I've divided in half and will post on two successive days. As my Patreon subscribers know, I've done this before. It's no big deal, and I will certainly do it again. However, for those of you who are listening solely to the podcast of Music History Monday and have not subscribed to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music, tomorrow's second half of this fascinating story will remain unheard or unread, as the case may be. To my mind, This is a sorry state of affairs, like eating half a potato chip or watching just the first half of Gone with the Wind. The solution is simple. Subscribe. Just a suggestion. Music and Electricity Now bear with me, as I will do my darndest to briefly explain the development of electronically produced and manipulated sound as it evolved in the 20th century without confusing either you or myself. A momentary but heartfelt bit of praise for the grid. How do we love thee? Can we even hope to count the ways? Personally, I cannot count them. When our power goes out here in Oakland, California, infrequent an event though it may be, life as I know and understand it comes to a screeching halt, so completely dependent am I on devices that employ the controlled movement of electrons between atoms. My dependence is in fact a recent phenomenon. Mass electrification in Europe and North America did not begin until the early 20th century, first in major cities and in areas served by electric railways. By 1930, roughly 70% of all households in the United States had electricity. That might sound like a high number, but huge swatches of American territory and population were without electric power and, for that matter, often without plumbing, sanitary sewage and storm drainage, and telephone service. In 1934, fewer than 11% of all farms in the United States had electrical power. It wasn't until 1935, with the creation of the Rural Utility Service, 
by executive order of President Franklin Roosevelt that this issue was systematically addressed. By 1942, nearly 50% of all farms on the United States had electricity. And by 1952, almost all farms in the United States finally did indeed have electricity. 1952. For some of us, 71 years might seem like a long time ago, but in fact, it was by any historic measure yesterday. And so the development of electronic musical instruments during the 20th century, something that went hand in hand with the electrification, was likewise a very recent event. Strictly defined, an electronic musical instrument or an electrophone, quote, is a musical instrument that produces sound using electronic circuitry. Such an instrument sounds by outputting an electrical, electronic, or digital audio signal that ultimately is plugged into a power amplifier, which then drives a loudspeaker, creating the sound heard by the performer and listener." Unquote. Precursors. Because I know you come to Music History Monday, meaning me, for the whole story, I am compelled to point out that the first electrified musical instruments date to the 18th century. The first so-called electronic musical instrument was very likely a specialized harpsichord-like device designed and built by a Czech cleric, natural scientist, and musician named Vaclav Divyshek, 1698 to 1765. Sometime around 1748, Divyshek built a large keyboard instrument, which is sadly long since lost, that sent an electrical charge through its iron strings in order to enhance and vary the quality of its sound. Vaclav Divyshek called his electro toy a Denis d'Or, meaning Golden Dionysus. Other such experimental metal stringed instruments came and went, including something called a clavecin électrique, built by a French Jesuit priest named Jean Baptiste de la Borde in 1761. However, it wasn't until the invention of the first amplifying vacuum tube, the so called Audion, in 1906 by the American electrical engineer Lee de Forest, that electronic music as we understand it came into being. The vacuum tube facilitated, among other things electronic, the construction of devices that both generated and synthesized, that is, combined sounds and amplified those sounds. Among the best known of these early sound synthesizers was the theremin, invented in St. Petersburg in 1919 by Leon Theremin, or in Russian, Lev Sergeyevich Theremin. The Andes Martineau, which was invented by the French cellist Maurice Martineau in 1928, and the Hammond Organ Model A, invented by Lawrence Hammond, which was manufactured in Evanston, Illinois, and first marketed in 1935. Now please, some references and links. For more on the theremin, including a video demonstration slash performance, I would direct your attention to my post, The Remarkable Peter Pringle, which appeared on Patreon on March 12, 2022. For lots more on the Hammond organ, I would direct your attention to my Dr. Bob Prescribes post on the Hammond organist, Joey DeFrancesco, which appeared on December 13th, 2022. Finally, for a brief but spirited mention of the Andes Martineau, I would direct your attention to Music History Monday for December 2nd, 2019, which was about Olivier Messiaen's Tarangalila Symphony of 1949, a work that prominently features an Andes Martineau. The Modular Synthesizer 
the modular synthesizer, or what we might think of as a full-service synthesizer, came into being in the late 1950s. These are machines that electronically generate a wide variety of sounds, in fact, for all intents and purposes, an infinite variety of different sounds, by connecting or patching together various modules, each of which plays a different function. One module will generate the fundamental waveforms, sine, square, triangle, and sawtooth waves. Another module will control the wavelength, that is, the relative pitch, and another the amplitude, the relative loudness or softness. Other modules will combine and filter this sonic information patched into them, and so forth. In 1957, two prominent inventors and engineers, Harry Olson and Herbert Baylor, completed work on their magnum opus the RCA Mark II sound synthesizer, which they built at the RCA Labs in Princeton, New Jersey. For our information, this Harry Olson, 1901 to 1982, was the acoustic research director for the RCA laboratories in Princeton and personally held over 100 patents in everything from submarine communications to magnetic tape to digital musical synthesis. Built to the specifications of two music composition professors, Milton Babbitt, 1916 to 2011, of Princeton, and Vladimir Usachevsky, 1911 to 1990, of Columbia, the RCA Mark II sound synthesizer filled an entire room. Nicknamed Victor, as in the early recording company RCA Victor, it was the first programmable electronic music synthesizer. Victor was the heart and soul of the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center, a machine on which any sort of pitched or non-pitched sound could be created, manipulated, combined, altered, and then recorded on tape. A user programmed and controlled Victor by punching holes in rolls of paper via a typewriter-like keyboard, rolls of paper that looked like player piano rolls. The process was incredibly slow and cumbersome. Victor was cumbersome as well. With over 750 vacuum tubes, Victor required constant maintenance and generated an extraordinary amount of heat. Eventually housed in Columbia's Prentice Hall, at 632 West 125th Street, Victor was associated with most of the luminaries of 1950s and 1960s electronic music, including Edgar Varese, Xu Wenchung, Bülent Aral, Mario Davidowski, Wendy Carlos, Charles Warren, and Luciano Berrio. But to this day, Victor is most closely associated with Milton Babbitt, who composed a series of superb works for both solo synthesizer and works that combined synthesized tape parts generated and recorded on Victor with live performers. The Triumph of Technology? In 1957, the same year Victor went into service, the Soviet Union launched the first artificial Earth satellite into orbit a device called Sputnik 1. The Western world freaked out. There, in the middle of the Cold War, with the threat of missile-delivered nukes literally hanging over everybody's heads, them Ruskies had beat the West into space. Something called the Sputnik crisis ensued, a period of public fear in the West that a huge and growing scientific gap existed between the United States and the Soviet Union. The scientist and science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote 2001, spoke for many when he said that, quote, the day that Sputnik orbited around the Earth, the U.S. became a second-rate power, unquote. In the United States, overnight, 
Calls were made for crash programs in science education, technology, and space exploration, and the space race began. NASA was founded, as was DARPA, that would be the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Billions, and I mean many billions of dollars, were thrown at American education and industry in order to overcome the gaps, what were perceived as an education gap, a missile gap, and a generalized technological gap between the Soviets and the West. These might have been frightening times, but for technologists in any field, <laughs> these were heady times as well. As the space scientist John Jeffries recalled, quote, the week after Sputnik went up, we were digging ourselves out of this avalanche of money that suddenly descended, unquote. This was the techno environment into which Victor and the new synthesized music was born, a sort of music that resonated entirely with the scientific and technological climate of the day. The next big thing? It was a period when an increasing number of composers and musically inclined engineers believed that creating electronic music recorded directly onto tape, which they claimed was analogous to the way a painter paints directly onto a canvas, was the future of music. For such composers, creating electronically synthesized music and the technological revolution it appeared to represent was the inevitable next step in musical progress, the next big thing. As it turned out, they were wrong, for which we must all be grateful. But at the time, the idea of an entirely new music, one based on electronically synthesized sounds, swept through the musical community. Among those musically inclined engineers, at virtual ground zero of the electronic music revolution in 1957, was a senior at the Columbia University School of Engineering and Applied Science named Robert Moog. Robert Arthur Moog, 1934 to 2005. He was born in New York City, meaning Manhattan, on May 23, 1934, and grew up in the borough of Queens. Moog graduated from the Bronx High School of Science in 1952. Now please, a word about the Bronx High School of Science, because it was and it remains a big deal. Founded in 1938, it is a highly specialized public school run by the New York City Department of Education. Bronx science, as it is known, is extremely selective. Of the 30,000 eighth and ninth graders who take the admission test for entrance into one of New York City's specialized high schools, only 800 are admitted to Bronx science. Bronx science graduates have won eight Nobel Prizes, seven in physics and one in chemistry, far and away the most by any secondary school in the world. Alumni of the school have also garnered two Turing Awards, unofficially known as the Nobel Prize for Computer Science, six National Medals of Science, the United States' highest scientific honor, and eight Pulitzer Prizes. Back to Robert Moog. Forced as a child to study the piano, or so Moog later claimed, he preferred hanging out in the workroom of his father, who was an engineer with Consolidated Edison, the utility company that serves New York City's metropolitan area. Now, whether he had to be forced to play the piano or not, Robert Moog developed a deep and powerful inclination towards sound and towards making music. As a youngster, he became captivated by the theremin, and at the age of 14, he built one from plans he found in the technical periodical Electronics World. Moog continued to build electronic musical instruments as a hobby. 
1953, at the age of 19, he designed his own theremin, and in 1954, he founded R.A. Moog Company, through which he sold theremins and theremin kits while he was in college. Interface The theremin is played by waving one's hands in front of two antennas. One hand, one antenna, controls the pitch, and the other the dynamics or volume. As an interface, meaning the point of contact between the user and the system, this hand-waving thing is imprecise at best. It is also highly specialized. Aside from the air guitar, there are no other musical instruments played that way. So techniques attained on one type or family of instruments are not transferable to the theremin. Please, think automotives. Whether you're operating a go-kart, a golf cart, a car, or an 18-wheeler, your basic interface is the same a steering wheel, and foot pedals. The knowledge of how to drive one of these vehicles is transferable to another, the scale of the device you're driving notwithstanding. Enter Raymond Scott, born Harry Warno, 1908 to 1994. Scott, who was born in Brooklyn, New York, to Russian Jewish immigrants, was a Juilliard-trained composer, pianist, band leader, record producer, and inventor of electronic instruments. According to Gert Jan Blom and Jeff Winner, quote, Scott sought to master all aspects of sound capture and manipulation. His special interest in the technical aspects of recording, combined with the state-of-the-art facilities at his disposal, provided him with enormous hands-on experience as a musical engineer, unquote. In 1952, the 44-year-old Raymond Scott bought a theremin from the 18-year-old Bob Moog. Having fiddled around a bit with Moog's theremin, pun intended, Scott decided that he required a more serviceable interface, a steering wheel, as it were, for his theremin. So building on Moog's theremin module, Scott created an instrument he called a clavivox, an instrument that employed a keyboard as an interface. The young Robert Moog was impressed. In an interview given many years later, he remarked, quote, A lot of the sound-producing circuitry of the clavivox resembled very closely the first analog synthesizer my company made in the mid-60s. Some of the sounds are not the same, but they're close." Unquote. Raymond Scott's Clavibox, essentially a keyboard-driven theremin built on a module created by Robert Moog, became for Moog his stepping stone to a keyboard-driven modular synthesizer. When we return in tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes post, we will pick things up from here with Robert Moog's continuing education and partnerships, the invention of the transistor in 1947, and then the integrated circuit in 1959, inventions that made a portable synthesizer possible, and Wendy Carlos's Switched on Bach, an album that forever changed the perception of the synthesizer from an electronic sound effect machine, meaning a toy, to that of a musical instrument. Thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.